I am an economist. And for nine years, I worked at the Congressional Budget Office in Washington, D.C. CBO is the budget arm of the U.S. Congress. And along with my coworkers and colleagues, we tackled important policy issues of the day. The fiscal situation of Social Security, patterns in joblessness, patterns in food stamp participation, who is going on and coming off the disability insurance program. And I would write reports, lots and lots of reports. I would read the research, I'd get some data, I'd do some analysis, I'd make a table or a graph, something that looked like this. This is the sort of thing that we were putting out. This is the first draft of a, of a main figure from a report on Social Security reform. We were looking at 30 different options for Social Security reform, and we were planning to show changes in benefits and taxes paid, the balance between the two for many different years. We were prepared to present to members of Congress a spreadsheet. I mean, we were gonna show them a spreadsheet. Now, I'd make these graphs, and I'd throw them in a report, and I'd surround it by a bunch of text, and I'd edit and revise and publish, and I would wait. And I would wait. And no one would call. <laughs> no one would call with questions. No one would call with clarifications. It just sort of went out there. I wasn't invited to fancy congressional hearings, and I certainly wasn't invited to fancy Washington, D.C. parties. The reports just sort of went out and disappeared into the ether. So one day, I came upon an advertisement for Edward Tufte's one-day workshop on presenting data. You may have heard of Edward Tufte, sort of known as a specialist in data visualization. Well, I took the workshop, and I learned two primary things. The first thing I learned is that people are going to read your graphs. They're going to look at your visualizations. Now, in many years of graduate school and many years of professional service, no one ever asked me to think about my audience or my reader. No one ever taught me how to write well, how to make good graphs, how to give good presentations. Communication was really never part of the education or really part of the job. Now, the second thing I learned in Tufti's course were sparklines. This is an example of sparklines. They basically take a complex line chart and they break it into smaller pieces so that you can sort of more easily see these patterns. Now, sparklines were important to me because at the time I was working on this report. And so what I did was I changed it just slightly. I took out some of the numbers and I replaced them with small graphs so that at a moment's notice, you could get to see the patterns and see the trends, so that here in this first option, the balance in the trust fund doesn't change over time, and in the second one, it increases and flattens out, and in the third, it increases over the entire period, and in the last one, it declines over time. It's not an earth-shattering visualization, there's no fancy interactivity, there's no crazy new graph types, but it was the first time I had said, let's think about this audience and how we're going to communicate these data to that audience. And now, we made new graphs, and we made new report types, and we started making infographics, sort of combinations of graphs and illustrations and text and data. And so one day in the summer of 2012, having just made this infographic that accompanied a 110-page report on the long-term budget outlook, outlook of the U.S. federal budget, I'm in my office, and there's a TV out in the hallway, and it's showing a House Budget Committee hearing. And suddenly I hear yells from the hallway, John, come out, come out, your infographic is on TV. <laughs> sure enough, Congressman Chris Van Hollen from Maryland is holding up that infographic. It's not the first time, obviously, CBO numbers have been used in Congress. They're used all the time. But it's the first time that I'm aware of that an infographic was held up in a, in a hearing. Right? This is a win. This is a policymaker using this graphic to have a discussion possibly to affect change, to affect policy. Now, since this time, I've made it my mission to try to help people improve the way they communicate their data, communicate their research, communicate their analysis. Because if you can't communicate your work, it doesn't help anyone. So if you're communicating to a member of Congress, if you're communicating to a manager, if you're communicating to a decision maker, you're communicating to another researcher, even communicating to a colleague, what I'd like to encourage you to do is to think carefully about your audience and how you can help them. Whether they need a static graph and a PDF report or an interactive online data visualization, how can you help lead them to an insight? Make them, help them find conclusions or make discoveries or help them do their jobs better? So I have two ideas, two concepts that I think can help you on your way to creating great, effective visualizations. The first concept I want to share with you is the purpose of data visualization. 
And here I'm going to think in forms or, or, or spectrums or axes. The first spectrum, the first axis, is the form axis. And here, visualizations run from static to interactive. Static visualizations are not active, they're not moving. Interactive visualizations are ones in which there's an exchange of information between the user and the interface. And somewhere in between are animated visualizations. These might be films, these might be videos, these might be slide decks. Now, we also have a function axis. And here, visualizations run from explanatory to exploratory. Explanatory visualizations are ones in which I, as the creator, am telling you a story, trying to get you to buy into my ideas, my conclusions, my hypotheses. Exploratory visualizations are ones in which I'm going to allow you, as the user or the reader, to dive in and come away with your own ideas, your own hypotheses, your own conclusions. So if we put these two together, we end up in this space. And what I'd like to do is walk through examples of all four quadrants. And as I do so, I would encourage you to think very carefully about your audience and how you can help them. So let's start on the top left quadrant with static explanatory graphics. Now, we've seen and make these all the time, line charts and area charts and bar charts. But we can take these very simple graphs and move them a step further by thinking about our audience. As an example, this is a bubble chart from the LA Times. And what it shows is the relationship between changes in violent crime and changes in property crime rates for about 35 cities in California. And you have to remember, the average LA Times reader may not be familiar with the bubble chart. But they come to this graph, and they see a big red box in the top right with a big word that says, worse. <laughs> and then there's a big blue box in the bottom left with a big blue word that says, better. And then in each quadrant is a small, bold-faced title with one or two sentences so that this graph both tells a user how to read the graph and what content they should get away from the graph. OK, let's go into the top right quadrant with static exploratory graphics. So again, these aren't active. They're not moving. We're asking the user to go in and explore on their own. This is an infographic from uh, designer Christina Schuchs that looks at the relationship between a movie's critic reviews and its profitability. So for each one of these little glyphs, we have two vertical lines. The left vertical line has the Rotten Tomato score of each movie. And on the right vertical line, we have the difference between the movie's budget and its gross. So the gap is showing the profitability. And notice that she's not telling you a specific story. She's not telling you that comedies have become more highly rated over time or that thrillers are more profitable than dramas. You, as the reader, have to go in and explore this visualization and come away with your own ideas and conclusions and stories. OK, now we go into the bottom half of this spectrum, this space. Now, when I was at CBO, we didn't live in the interactive half of this place because we didn't think members of Congress were going to sit down and click with an interactive online tool. But we see these all the time now. As an example of an exploratory interactive graphic, this is the State Economic Monitor from the Urban Institute. And what we've done here is created a number of different visualization types, maps and column charts and line charts, so that the user can go in and explore different aspects of the US economy, of the housing market, of the income distribution, allowing the user to go in and explore the visualization on his or her own. In the bottom left quadrant, we have interactive visualizations that tell a story. This is a project from the New York Times that allows you to tell the story of which candidate you believe will win the presidential election. You believe Hillary Clinton's going to win Florida and Pennsylvania. You can choose the states that you think Donald Trump needs to win to win the White House. You can easily imagine this being written out in text in the Times, but the interactivity allows you to tell the story. Now, somewhere in the middle of this space are animated visualizations. It doesn't mean that they're the best. It just means that they have different elements of this space. This is Aaron Coblin's Flight Patterns Project. It shows all flight paths in US airspace over a 24-hour period. You can see as we go from day to night, the country largely uh, grows dark, and people make their red-eye flights from the west coast across to the east coast. And as we get near daybreak, we see flights from Europe come across the Atlantic, and then the East Coast wakes up, and we move across the country. As the country wakes up and the air has become filled with planes, and as we get near the end of the day, we see people on the West Coast in San Francisco and Los Angeles make their journeys over to Hawaii. <laughs> it has different elements of this space. It allows you to explore the visualization by zooming in and zooming out, by rewinding and fast-forwarding the video. It works as a static visualization allowing you to see the skies in ways that a bar chart or a table might just not let you do. So that's the first concept I want to share with you, to think about the purpose of your visualization and how it helps meet the needs of that audience, lead them to an insight, help them find conclusions. 
The second concept I want to share with you is how to choose a graph. Because there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between data types and graph types. A bar chart can be used to show changes over time. It can also be used to allow you to compare categories. So I got together with a graphic designer friend, his name is Severino Rebecca, and we set out trying to create a library of different graphic types. Something, a project that I call the graphic continuum. And so what we ended up doing, ended up collecting nearly 90 different graphs and putting them on a poster. And so what we have is six different categories here, distribution, time, comparing categories, geospatial, part to whole, and relationship. It's a thought starter. It's a way to say, I have some time series data. What are all the different ways that I can present those data? And how do they relate across these different categories? So we published this two foot by three foot poster and people were very excited about it. And then I got to some emails that said, this is great, except I work in a cubicle. I don't have wall space for a poster. So we created a smaller version. It's just an eight and a half by 11 card. Again, the purpose is to be a thought starter, to get people to think about different visualization types. And what I'd like to do is tell you about this project, tell you about this graphic continuum. And to do so, I'm going to use one of my kids' books. So if you have kids, you may be familiar with these books. If you don't have kids, you should go buy these books, because they are all fantastic. <laughs> there's, there's If You Give a Moose a Muffin, If You Give a Pig a Party, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie, and they all use what's known as a circular storytelling device. So in the case of this book, the kid gives the moose a muffin, who eats another muffin and another muffin, until there are no more muffins. Well, then they're going to go to the store to buy more muffin mix, so they get their jackets on. Oh, there's a hole in the jacket. They have to get a needle and thread to fix it. And it continues all the way around until back, where the moose says, ah, oh, yes, I want more muffins. So I want to tell you about this graphic continuum, but I'm not going to use the story of a moose and a muffin. I'm going to use my own story. <laughs> so let's begin. If you give a nerd a number, he might want a table to go with it. <laughs> and he could add more and more numbers, and he could take that one number, and he could plot it in an XY space. And he could add another number, and another number, and even more numbers. And this might remind him of other graphic types he could use. It might remind him of a st stacked area chart, or a normalized area chart, or even other shapes he could use, like a paired column chart, or a stacked column chart. And he could take that chart, and he could rotate it 90 degrees to create a paired bar chart, or a stacked bar chart. If we were to go back to that line chart, he could add more and more data. And this might re remind him that he could break up this chart for small multiples or spark lines. And this might remind him that he could focus just on the endpoints of this graph to create a slope chart, to which, again, he could rotate 90 degrees to create a dot plot. And all this uncertainty about what graphs we use for what data we have and all of these options might remind him to lead him to think about uncertainty, might lead him to think about a fan chart, or a box and whisker plot, or a violin chart. And he could take that line chart and maybe add a second vertical axis, as this may lead him to think about correlations, which might lead him to think about a scatter plot, to which he could add another variable to create a bubble chart, or the unfortunate 3D bubble chart. <laughs> or he could look at the correlations with the lines to create other shapes, may lead him to think about a parallel coordinates plot, or other shapes like a radar chart. And he could combine the correlations with the lines to create a connected scatter plot in which correlations are plotted over time. And this very simply may lead him to think about connections, which might lead him to think about a network diagram, or a force-directed layout, or a hive chart. And the curves in the hive chart may lead him to think about a chord diagram. And the arcs in the chord diagram may lead him to think about an arc chart. And he could go back to the line chart, which might have shown time, and combine it with the arc chart to create a sequential arc chart in which time is plotted from point A to point B, point B to point C, and point A to point C. And this, very simply, may lead him to think about time, which may lead him to think about a flow diagram, or a tree diagram, or very simply a timeline, to which he could rotate 90 degrees to create a Gantt chart, <laughs> or a more familiar shape, to create a calendar. And he could take the circles from the bubble chart and combine it with the calendar to create a nightingale. But a nightingale is really just a circle that's been exploded out in all different directions, and he could rein that back in, and that may lead him to think about a pie chart. <laughs> to which, unfortunately, he could rotate to create a 3D pie chart. <laughs> or he could blow it up. He could punch a hole in the middle of it. He could blow it up again. He could cut it in half. But all that's just a variation on a circle. And this may lead him to think about other shapes he could use may lead him to think about squares, may lead him to think about a tree map, to which, again, he could explode to create a square cloud or stack them on top of each other to create a unit chart. And the squares in the unit chart may lead him to think about other shapes he could use to present data, may lead him to think about an isotype plot. And the images of people in the isotype 
may lead him to think about high-frequency data, which might lead him to think about a heat map, or a contour map, or the truly unfortunate contour map. <laughs> and this, quite simply, may lead him to think about maps, to which he could add circles, or squares, or lines. And the connections formed by the lines on the map may lead him to think about a specific spot on that map, where he's talking to you about trying to visually communicate data to an audience so that they can use it. And you could take that point off that map and plot it in an XY space, and so if you were to give a nerd a graph, he might want a number to go with it. So that's this graphic continuum project. We have nine, nearly 90 different graphic types. It's not all the graphic types. It's a thought starter. It's a library to get you started. Because a bar chart can be used to show changes over time, but also to compare categories. Bubbles can sit out on their own. They can be put in an XY space, or they can be placed on a map. The key is to consider the needs of your audience and how your visualizations can help your audience, whether they need a static visualization, whether they need an interactive online data tool so that they can explore the data. What matters is that you consider the purpose of your visualization and how it helps that audience, how it helps them lead them to an insight or find conclusions or make discoveries or helps them do their job better, which in turn can help you do your job better. What matters is that we consider the vast array of possibilities of ways to visualize data, not because new, crazy, fancy graph types are inherently better, but because sometimes seeing data in different ways can help lead us to different conclusions and make different discoveries. And I believe anyone can learn how to do this. I believe anyone can learn how to better communicate to their audience. I certainly learned how to do so, and I believe you can learn how to do so as well. Thank you very much.